Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you the owner of the house you live in? If so, and if that house has a mortgage on it, then our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, has some interesting and important information for you. In just about 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will give you the facts about America's finest plan for home ownership. It's called the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, a money-saving plan that has meant increased security for thousands of homeowners. Tonight's FBI file, The Mysterious Fugitive. It is the proud record of your FBI that 97% of those the Bureau apprehends and takes to court are later found guilty and sentenced. Now, that record indicates a thoroughness and a basic respect for detail in every investigation. Because it often happens that the only testimony for the prosecution is given by special agents of your FBI. After conviction, the file on that case is marked closed. Now, those files are records of jobs well done. Records of which the Bureau is justifiably proud. For that reason, it is understandable that your FBI does not like to reopen a file that's been marked closed does not like to have to do its job all over again. That does not happen very often, but as you will see in tonight's case, it does happen. Tonight's FBI file opens at the mouth of a river located in one of our eastern seaboard states. A cabin cruiser courses slowly down the stream, rounding a bend and reaching the sea, it noses into a weather-worn dock. The pilot, a young man in his middle twenties, ties the boat to a stanchion and walks down the dock to a dilapidated waterfront hotel. He opens the sun warped screen door and enters the lobby. Hello? Anyone here? Just a minute. Well. Hello. What do you want? Are you in charge here? Yeah. Why? I'm looking for information. What about? Uh, one of the boats that's tied to the dock out there. Which one? The Sea Maid 2. Who owns that, do you know? No. Well, isn't that dock connected with your hotel? Mm, everybody uses it. Oh. Look, mister, if you just came here to ask questions, I haven't got the Oh, time. no, wait, please. What is it? The Sea Maid passed me an hour, uh, an hour or so ago upstream, and I thought I recognized that pilot. Did you see that boat tie up? No. Well, perhaps you know this man. He's about my size, blonde hair, mustache. His name is Sebring. 
Never heard of him. But if he uses this doc... I told you anybody could Well, he couldn't it. have docked more than 10 or 15 minutes ago. Where could he have gone from here, do you know? Oh, well, to town, maybe. What town? Fairfield, Clearwater, Twin Falls, they're all near here. I see. Well, I guess I'll just have to wait for him. Sometimes people leave their boats here for days. I'll wait. <laughs> Who's there? Yeah. What is it? What do you want? I gotta see you. All right. Come in. I told you, Anna, that I wanted to take a nap. Yeah, I know. Well, why do you disturb me? Well, a man was here looking for you. What? Who was he? I don't know. What did he want? He didn't say. Did he ask for me by name? Yeah, he said you passed him in your boat upstream, and he thought he recognized you and followed you down here. Where is he now? He left. He returned to his boat. What did you tell him? That I didn't know who you were or where you'd gone. I see. He's going to wait for you anyhow. This is bad. Well, I tried my best to get rid of him, Frank. Raise the window shade. Yeah, sure. Just a trifle. How's that? Fine. Now, which one is his boat? Oh, uh, well, yeah, at the very end of the dock there. You see it? Yeah. Well, he must be below. Where's your husband? He went into town. As soon as he returns, send him up here. I have some work for him to do. Hello, aboard there. Yeah. Someone handling me? Yeah. What do you want? Are you the owner of this boat? Yeah. I see your license. Boat license? Nope, the license for using this dock. Oh, I, uh, I didn't know that one was necessary. It's a town ordinance. Who are you? Deputy sheriff. Oh, I see. Well, can I arrange to get a license from you? Nope. Got to get one in town. They open this time of night? Nope. Well, then what do I do? Leave the dock. I couldn't do that. Look, mister, that's an order. Sheriff, I... Well, I, uh... I might as well tell you why I'm here. All I'm interested in is a license. Listen, Sheriff, that boat right over there, the sea maid too. I followed it down the river this afternoon. There was a man aboard that I think I recognized. Well? I know that government agents would be very anxious to apprehend him, if he's the man I think he is. Are you a government agent? No. Uh, any kind of policeman? No. Well, then why are you so interested? I was in Army intelligence during the war. Buddy, the war's all over. Yes, but don't you... Look, look, uh, where, which boat are you talking about? That one down there. With the black hull. Her name ain't Seamaid, too. Oh, yes, it is. That's the Ebony Queen. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Uh, come on, have a look for yourself. Very well. I'll prove to you that that's the Ebony Queen, mister. It's owned by a man named Smith who lives in Twin Falls. He ain't been in no trouble with the government ever. Well, is this Smith about my size, blonde hair, mustache? No, 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 sir. He's, he's short, fat, and bald. Well, well, would anyone else be using his boat? Nope. Well, what does it say there? Uh, Ebony Queen. Yeah. I, uh, I don't understand. That's the boat I followed. Look, mister, your story just don't make sense. You go on back to your boat. Cast off your lines and pull out of here. I'm sorry, Sheriff. I'm staying. Some 50 miles away in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of the agent in charge. Mr. Price. Yes, Jim? Could I see you for a moment, sir? Surely. What's on your mind? Well, I received a phone call late this afternoon from a friend of mine named Tom Logan. Yes? Tom was in Army intelligence during the war. We worked together on a number of cases involving enemy aliens. That was when I was with the New York office. I see. Uh, one of the men we picked up at the beginning of the war was a Nazi named Frank Sebring. Mm -hmm. He'd been engaged in subversive activity. He was convicted on several counts and sent to a federal prison. Mm. I remember hearing about him. Well, then you may recall also, sir, that Sebring was released at the end of the war and deported to Germany. Yes, I do, but uh, what's this got to do with your friend's phone call? Uh oh Well, Tom has been out on his boat for a fishing trip for the past week. This afternoon, a small pleasure cruiser passed him. Tom was almost certain the man at the wheel was Sebring. What? Yes. He said he followed the boat to a dock down near Twin Falls. 
No one was aboard her, so we inquired at a nearby hotel as to where the man had gone, but he couldn't learn anything there. Jim, this sounds more like a case of mistaken identity. Well, I thought so myself at first, sir, but Tom insisted he had the right man. Knowing him, I'm inclined to believe him. We have a file here on Sebring, Jim. Uh, check it. It's possible that we're both mistaken. Maybe he wasn't deported. I already have checked on it, sir. He was sent out of the country over six months ago. I see. Uh, where's your friend now? He's standing by down there waiting for the man to return. Has he uh, contacted the local police? I advised him to, but I'm not so sure that he will. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Price. Yeah? I wonder if you'd give me permission to go down there. If this is a false lead, I'll be back by tomorrow night. Yes, go ahead, Jim. from the window. It was too dark to see, but I didn't hear his boat pull away. Well, he ain't going. Why not? He just said he was going to wait until you came back. Did you impersonate a deputy sheriff? Yeah. Didn't you threaten to arrest him? Yeah, and he just said go ahead, so what could I do? What about the boat? Did you repaint the name? Uh-huh, but, but he's still going to stay. What did you find out about him? Well, he said he was in Army intelligence during the war. Oh? And he also said that government agents would be very happy to grab you. It's really going to be difficult to get rid of. Yeah. Where's Anna? Downstairs. Bring her up here at once. We're going to have to deal with this man a bit differently. Can you see all right, mister? Yes, just lead the way. When did this man come to your hotel? Oh, about oh, 20 minutes ago. Took a room for the night. His name is Sebring? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's got blonde hair and a mustache. Just like the fellow you was looking for. That's why I came right down to the boat to get you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, here's the back door. You go in this way. Now, his room is right at the head of these stairs. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute, mister. Yeah. I, uh, just happened to think. There ain't gonna be any trouble between you two, is there? Well, to tell you the truth, there might be. Oh. Well, then I'd better get the sheriff. He's right out in front in the lobby. It might not be a bad idea. Bring him up to the room. Yeah, Okay. Hello, Mr. Sebring. Hello. You remember me? Yes, of course. You're the young man who was in Army Intelligence. That's right. What brings you here? Your boat passed mine on the river today. I recognized you. So? You were deported from this country about six months ago, weren't you, Sebring? That's right. And how did you get back here? Illegally. You admit that? Yeah. Then I'm going to have to see to it that you're deported again. Really? How? By turning you over to the FBI. Have you the authority to make an arrest? No. Then how are you going to do it? This should be your answer. Come in. Here's the sheriff, mister. Good. Come in, sheriff. Okay. You wanted to see me? Yes, sheriff. This is the man I was looking for. Well? He's in this country illegally. He should be arrested and turned over to the FBI. Did you hear that, sheriff? Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, now, let me see. You should obey the man, you know. Oh, you think so, huh? Of course. What is this? Show him, Carl. Okay. <laughs> nice work, Sheriff. Tonight's case from the official files will be reopened in just a moment. Sweet Home, a song that never grows old because love of home and love of family are emotions that never die, never fade, never wither. Yes, and as long as men love their homes, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society will continue to feel proud of our assured home ownership plan. Proud because it's both a money saver and a home saver. Proud because it's America's finest plan for home ownership. Just what is this plan, anyway? Well, it has four main advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. 
What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Third, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. Fourth, mortgage interest is only 4%. And there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Could I prepay this uh, mortgage at an early date if some unexpected good fortune makes it possible, or if I should decide to sell the house? Yes, there is a liberal prepayment privilege. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Well, how can I find out if I meet those qualifications, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Mysterious Fugitive. The desire to see that justice is done is strong in almost every one of us. But sometimes that desire leads to trying to take the law into your own hands. As tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates, that is the wrong course of action. In every city, there is a local police force. In every state, there are state troopers. And in every section of the country, there are field offices of your FBI. It is their job to see that laws are enforced, that justice is dealt out fairly. Your job as a citizen is to respect and obey those laws. And when, as will sometimes happen, you know of a crime that's been committed or a criminal who has gone unpunished, do not assume the responsibility of seeing justice done. Your responsibility ends when you have done your duty, when you have notified your local police. Tonight's file continues at the police station in the town of Twin Falls. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just introduced himself to the chief of police. Sit down, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Did a man named Tom Logan contact you at any time yesterday or this morning? Logan? Mm -hmm. No, he didn't. Why? Well, he called me yesterday afternoon. He'd been out on his boat on the river, and he thought he recognized a man who had been deported from this country some six months ago. Where was he? On the river. This man was in another boat. He trailed him to a dock about uh, two miles north of here. The one near the Riverview Hotel? Yes, that's it. I told him to contact the police. I thought he might have come to you. He didn't. Have you tried the Fairfield police? Yes, I have. How about Clearwater? Oh, they hadn't heard from him either. Have you looked for him? Yes, I went down to the dock, but I couldn't find any trace of his boat. Maybe the man took off again and Logan followed him. Yes, that's very possible. Did he give you a description of the other boat, the one the suspect was on? No, he didn't. Well, I'm afraid that... Uh, oh, excuse me. Oh, certainly. Chief Merrill. Yes? Yes. What's that? Where was this? I see. What's the name of the boat? All right. Thanks a lot. I'll be right down there. Mr. Taylor. Yes? What does uh, Logan look like? Oh, he's about six feet tall. Has dark hair. Was the name of his boat the Lucky Star? Sounds like it, yes. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. What? The body of a man of that general description was just found in a boat named the Lucky Star. Oh, no. We well, can't be sure that it's Logan, of course. Where was this? About ten miles down the bay. It drifted in ashore. Let's get down there at once. Anna, find out who that is. Okay. Is that you, Carl? Yeah. We're here in the back room. 
Carl, did you go into the village? Yeah. Any news of the boat? Nope. It'll probably be found sometime this afternoon. That soon? I imagine so. Well, what'll we do, Frank? I'll leave tonight, just as I planned. I suppose the police should come here. Why should they? Well, when they find his body. They could also learn that he docked here. My dear sister, in the first place, we took great pains to make it appear that his death was accidental. Why, sure we did. Furthermore, no one knows that he used the dock except us. I hope not. Oh, look, Anna, stop worrying. Everything's going to be okay. There's the body right over there, Mr. Taylor. Yes, I see. Well, that's Tom Lovenoy. Too bad. Well, I guess we'll have to examine him. Look at the back of his head. Yes, I see. Say, there's blood on the back of that boat hook there. From the position of the body, he could have very easily slipped and fallen against it. He could have, but I don't think he did. I'd say this was very carefully staged to appear that way. You think he caught up with the man he was looking for? Yes. Uh, if only he'd contacted you, Chief, instead of trying to do the job alone. Yeah. Well, shall we go below? Oh, wait, I I want to search his pockets first. Very well. It's just barely possible that he might have left a note of some kind. Telling you more about this man he was following? Mm-hmm. We just had a description of his boat. Yes, I know. Find anything? Not just this book of matches. Might be of some help to us. How's that? They're from the Riverview Hotel. That's the place by the dock, isn't it? Yeah. Well, then you must have gone in there at some time. Uh, Chief, do you know the people who run it? Yes, a couple named Bremerton. Well, they might be able to give us some information. Well, we can... Hold on a minute. What is it? Some blue paint here on the deck. See? Yeah. Very odd shade of blue. There's no color like it on the boat been spilled there. Looks like it rubbed off or something. Uh-huh. I'm going to scrape a few flecks of it off. Want a knife? No, oh, I have one, thanks. Chief, why don't you go ashore and notify the coroner? I'll finish up here. Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. Thanks. Who's that? Chief of Police Merrill, Mrs. Bremerton. Mr. Merrill. Hello. This is Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Bremerton. How do you do? Hello. Uh, Mr. Taylor is a special agent of the FBI. I see. You might be able to help him. How? Well, yesterday afternoon, a man named Tom Logan put his boat into that dock outside. Tom Logan? That's right. He was a man about six feet tall. Had dark hair, slightly broken nose. Did you see him by any chance? No, sir. Well, we have reason to believe that he came here to your hotel. Well, I, I didn't see anybody that looked like him. Did you see his boat? It was called the Lucky Star. No, sir. I... Oh, well, here's my husband. He, he might be able to help you. Oh, good. Mr. Bremerton? Oh, hello, Chief. Oh, this is Mr. Taylor. He's from the FBI. Hiya. Hello there. We're looking for information, Mr. Bremerton, about a man named Logan who docked his boat outside here yesterday afternoon. It was called the Lucky Star. Did you see it? No, I didn't. Maybe you saw him. He was six feet tall, dark hair, slightly broken nose. No, no, but I didn't see him. Well, Chief, I'm afraid this was a bad lead. We'd better get going. But Thanks you... a lot anyway, folks. Come on, Chief. Okay. After you, sir. Right. Carl. Huh? Get upstairs. Tell Frank who was here and hurry. <laughs> Chief, let's head out here to the end of the dock. Okay. Say, hey, don't you think we should have questioned the Bremertons a little more? I purposely cut that interview short. Why? Did you notice Bremerton's trousers? No, I didn't. Well, there was a streak of blue paint on his right leg. And I'm certain it was the same color paint that I scraped off the deck of Logan's boat. Well. And that reminded me of where I'd seen that paint before. I noticed a can of it yesterday when I came down here to the dock. Where about? Right alongside this boat up here. Uh, Chief, uh, Shine your flashlight around, will you? Oh, okay. Hey, there's a paint can. Yeah, I think that's the one. See? The same odd shade of blue. Yeah. I wonder if... Wait a minute. I'll shine your light again on the stern of that boat. Right there? Yeah, that's it. 
Look, Chief, the name on that boat has been freshly painted. Ebony Queen. Did you suppose it was called something else before? That the name was changed to avoid suspicion? Could have been. Well, if it was, then that's Sebring's boat. Oh. This whole paint cycle ties together. I think Bremerton's mixed up in this, too. Look, you go aboard, search the boat. Right. I'm heading for the nearest phone to call my office. I want to see if anyone named Bremerton has ever been mixed up with Sebring. That you, Mr. Taylor? I'm below here. I've just been going through this chest. I found some papers that Bradley I... Put up your huh? hands. What are you doing on this boat? I'm Chief of Police Merrill. You haven't answered my question. Who are you? That doesn't matter. Would your name be Sebring? Yes, it is. Then you know why I'm here. Yes, but unfortunately it isn't going to do you any good. What do you mean? I'm about to take a trip down the river. I need a change. You won't get very far. I will if I travel alone. You'll be with me, Chief, but only in spirit. You talk real tough. As a matter of fact, I am. Is that you, Carl? Yeah. Come below. We have company. Okay. You undoubtedly know the Chief of Police. Yeah. He was nosing around down here. We're going to have to take care of him. Uh Uh-huh. Go above and cast off the line first. I would prefer that this happen while we're out on the river. Well, do as I say. I, uh, I can't. Why not? Because I have a gun in his back. Huh? Drop yours, Sebring. Pick up his gun, Chief. Okay, and thanks. My office told me that Bremerton was Sebring's brother-in-law, so I dropped oh. by, picked him up, and brought him down here. I'm sure glad you did. Now we can place them both under arrest. It was proved that although Logan was assaulted in the hotel, his death occurred on the boat. Therefore, Sebring was convicted in a federal court for murder on the high seas and sentenced to be executed. Carl and Anna were convicted as accomplices and given a life prison term in the federal penitentiary. At this time, your FBI marked its file not closed, but dead. And it was able to do that only because of the shrewd powers of observation of a special agent who remembered where he had seen an off-shade of paint. Now, those powers of observation are not a talent that anyone is born with, but they are a talent that can be developed, that has been developed in the course of study that every special agent must pass before he becomes a qualified member of your FBI, before he goes to work for you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. You know what I'm going to do first thing tomorrow, Mr. Keating? I'm going to find out if I can qualify for an assured home ownership plan. Mighty good idea, George, because... Look what you get in one package from the Equitable Society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies. And mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your Equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Juvenile Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. 
and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Juvenile Shakedown on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Homeowners, does this sound interesting to you? A mortgage that may save money for you and also furnishes you with life insurance security. Be sure to listen closely to the middle commercial. It's a special message to homeowners from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, telling you about the Equitable Society's assured home ownership plan. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, The Careless Killer. The enormity of the crime wave now engulfing the United States cannot be fully realized unless you know some of the figures. Figures which are the result of crime surveys made by your FBI. The number of people arrested and fingerprinted in this country in the past year is almost 25% higher than the number arrested 10 years ago in 1937. The number of crimes committed in the past year total more than a million six hundred thousand. During the average day, 36 people were slain. Every 24 hours, an average of almost 400 people were feloniously assaulted or robbed. In addition, there were more than 4,000 other larcenies of various types being committed every day. Those are the shocking proportions of the current crime wave. The crime wave about which something must be done immediately before it's too late. Tonight's FBI file opens in an apartment in a large Midwestern city. The occupants of this flat are a young married couple named Rockford. Mrs. Rockford is at the front door, just admitting a visitor. Oh, hello, Mom. Hiya, Peg. Come on in. Okay. Well, gee, you'll have to excuse how the house looks, Mom. I I didn't expect nobody so early. This ain't the first sloppy joint I've seen. Where's that husband of yours? Charlie? Well, how many husbands have you got? Just Charlie. Uh, He's in bed. Get him up. Oh, well, he's still sleeping, I said get him up. I want to talk to him. Sure, sure, okay. He uh, may not like this. That really worries me. Charlie? Hmm? Charlie? Huh? What? Charlie, will you wake up? Oh, what is it? My mother's here. Uh, so what? She wants to see you. Oh, look, tell her to come back later, huh? I don't feel Who cares like... what you feel like. Huh? Wake up, you bum. Oh, oh, good morning, Mrs. Wilton. It ain't morning, it's afternoon. Uh, Charlie didn't get to bed till awful late, Mom. Yeah, I... don't I... care about that. Are you awake enough to listen to something? Sure, sure. It's about that counterfeit stock plate you bought. Yeah? I advanced you the dough for it. I know you did. 4,000 bucks I gave you. That's right. It ain't worth 10 cents. What? Mom, what do you mean? Your little genius here has done it again. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. The guy guaranteed it. Oh, he did, huh? Yeah, he said all I had to do was put ink on the plate, then paper, then I had stock. You saw the certificates. I gave them to you. And I tried to cash them. What happened? The company he picked went out of business ten years ago. Oh. 
Mom, how was Charlie to know that? Shut up. When I think of all the smart thieves you could have married, and I get a son and all like that. Oh, no, now look, Mother. Never mind that mother routine. Who was the guy you bought that plate from? A man named Carson. All right. Get dressed and get over and see him. What for? Get me my money back. Oh, but I can't do that. Why not? The deal's all closed. You can open it up again. You got a gun, ain't you? Sure. Take it along with you. Let him see you mean business. Oh, I know. Get but... over there. If you don't come back here with the money, you can use the gun on yourself. <laughs> In the same city, in the nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just reporting to his agent in charge. You sent for me, Mr. Stilling? Oh, yes, Jim. Just got a report from our Chicago office. Huh? Wants you to get right to work on it. What's it all about, sir? National Stolen Property Act. They picked up a suspect yesterday who was trying to pass over $5,000 worth of counterfeit stock certificates. I see. And the agents who searched his effects found that he also had counterfeit stock plates in his possession. (laughs) Well, did his own printing job, huh? That's right. Well, this man was questioned for a number of hours, and he finally broke down and revealed where he got the plates. And where was that? Right here in town. Well... He claimed he got them from a man named Carson. Here's his address, Jim. All right, sir. According to the suspect's testimony, this Carson makes a business of turning out counterfeit stock plates. I see. Get right over there and check on Carson. Okay. See what you can find out. our story opens, we find Betty Jane, girl of the hills, sitting in the palatial drawing room of her husband Roger's mansion. That's enough of that. Ah, oh, Mom, what'd you turn it off for? Are you kidding? But I want to hear it. It's such a sweet, sad story. It's all about a girl who's looking for a missing husband. I'd rather and... hear about your missing husband. What's keeping that guy? Well, he's only been gone an hour. It's almost two hours. Mom, you don't like Charlie very well, do you? You can say that again. Well, what have you got against him? Mostly the fact that he breathes in and out. You know, it hurts him real bad when you talk to him real mean like you do. Ain't that a shame. He he says he thinks of you like you're his real mother. That's just how he treats me. Do you realize how much dough I've shelled out for that grifter? Well, it was all on business deals. Some business deals. First, I set him up in that bookmaking joint. He blows that one. I make him a fence. He kicks that around. Oh, those were bad breaks. This one was the topper. A six-year-old kid. A backward six-year-old. Couldn't miss making dough these days. But no, oh, he... Oh, I'll, I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, Charlie. Yeah? Huh? You what? What's the matter? Oh, Charlie, that's terrible. What is it? Uh, hold on a minute. What's wrong? Charlie went to see that Mr. Carson. Yeah, did he get the dough? No. Why not? They had a fight. Charlie killed him. That's great. He wants to know what he should do. Wait a minute. Tell him to get out of town. Hello, Charlie. I just told Mom. She said you should get out of town. Huh? Wait a minute. He says he hasn't any dough. Tell him to dig it someplace. He ain't getting it from me. Oh, but, Mom... Let me talk to that guy. All right, here. Hello? Yeah, this is Mother. I want you to listen to me, stupid, and listen close. You get out of town right now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't seeing Peg because she's coming with me. Look, get this straight. If you come near my club, you won't have to worry about the cops. I'll take care of you myself. Mr. Sterling. Yes, Jim. May we come in? Come ahead. This is Detective Harvey, Homicide Squad. Mr. Sterling. Hello, sir. Hello, Harvey. Did you go to Carson's office? Yes, sir. That's why I brought Harvey back here with me. What do you mean? Carson was shot and killed this afternoon. Well, when was this? About ten minutes before I arrived. What about the killer? We don't know who he is yet, sir. Let's have the whole story, Jim. All right, sir. Well, as I told you, as soon as I arrived at Carson's office, I found his body. Was uh, anyone else there? Yes, a young lady, his secretary. Hmm. Could she shed any light on the killing? Well, she didn't know the name of the man who did it, but she said he had been in Carson's office before. Oh? I got a complete description of him from the girl, sir. 
Right down to a ring that he was wearing. Good. I also learned why this man was there. Yes? The secretary admitted that he'd bought some counterfeit stock plates from Carson in the past. On this visit, he had an argument with him, claiming these plates were worthless. And that evidently led to the shooting. Mm Mm-hmm. Where is the secretary? We're holding her now as a material witness. You can question her at any time. Good. Well, Mr. Sterling, we have an interest in finding this killer, too. How's that? The secretary stated that he walked out of there with another set of counterfeit stock plates. Well, I'd suggest you work right along with the police on this. All right, sir. You can come down to headquarters with me now, Jim. We can see if the secretary's identified anyone, Kate. Is uh, she looking over pictures? Yes, sir. Then get going. Oh, Jim. Oh, yeah, well. I've just talked to Carson's secretary. Any luck? Yes, yeah, she's identified the murderer. Good. Who is it? A small-time thief named Charlie Rockford. Charlie Rockford. Mm, I see. Our lieutenant seems to have a pretty good line on him. Oh? Knows where he lives, where he hangs out. Hey, that's fine. They've sent out a general alarm on him. They also have a squad car on the way over to his home. Good. Oh, Bob, I'd like to talk to that secretary now. See if I can get a complete line on Carson's operation. Table four on the house. Mom, Mom. What is it, Peg? Charlie's here. What? He just came in. He's waiting out by the check room. What for? Well, he says he's got to see you. That chump. I told him not to come here. He says to tell you that a mother shouldn't desert a son in his hour of peril. Well, that guy quit saying he's my son. Well, Mom, you know that Never he... mind, never mind. He can't be standing out there like a signpost. Bring him back to my office. Sure, okay. I'll be right there. <laughs> Charlie. Uh, what'd she say, Peg? She wants you to come back to her office. Oh, swell. Let's go. She's sort of mad at you, Charlie. Oh, look, honey, I'll con her out of that. She says you shouldn't have come here. Now, what sort of way is that to act to her own flesh and blood? She says you ain't her flesh and blood, Charlie. Listen, I'm getting sick of what she says. Now, don't go acting that way. Here we are. Go ahead. Okay. Hiya, Mother. I thought I told you to keep away from here. I'm in trouble. Lash. Look, I'm hot, I tell you. So I see by the newspapers. Huh? The papers have got something about me? Only a story and a picture. Oh, so that's why them cops showed up. What do you mean, Charlie? Showed up where? At the apartment. You went back to your apartment? Yeah. Why? Well, I thought maybe Peg would be there. Why, you stupid... What happened with the cops? Well, I happened to spot the squad car pulling up in front of the building, so I slammed down a fire escape. And then you came right over here? Yeah. That's great. Drag me into this thing. How? They wouldn't be tailing you or nothing. Oh, I gave them the slip. Some slip you could give them. Blind Tom could follow you. You shouldn't have done that, Charlie. Oh, look, lay off of me, will you? Both of you. I need some dough, getaway money. And that's what you came here for? Yeah. Not a chance. Oh, now, wait a minute. You're in this thing, too, you know. How do you figure that? Well, you put up the dough for that phony stock plate. You were the one who told me to use a gun to get the dough back. Charlie, that isn't fair. Let him talk. I want to hear more. Sure, I'll talk. I'll tell you this right now. Unless you kick in with a bundle for me to go away with, I blow a whistle on you. (gasps) I bet you would, too. Sure. So how about it? Are you getting it up? The answer's still no. Okay. Maybe this will change your mind. Charlie! I was wondering when you'd pull that gun. How about some dough? Charlie, put down that gun. She's my mother. Never mind the song titles. Come on, money. Your desk is loaded with cash, I know that. Well, I was always taught to pay a good deal of respect to a guy with a pistol. Mom, don't you give him anything. Keep out of this. Looks like I gotta give him something, honey. Think this would be enough? <laughs> Is he dead? What do you think? Mom, you shouldn't have done that. Tonight's case from the official FBI files will be reopened in just a moment. Home, sweet home. 
I forget the words now, but it's always hard for a man to express his real feeling, the warmth, the love of his own home. As a homeowner myself, I know what you mean. And for that reason, I also know you'll be interested in the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. It's a money saver. It's a home saver. It's America's finest plan for home ownership. Assured home ownership? Well, what is this plan and why is it the finest? The Assured Home Ownership Plan has these four main advantages. First, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Second, during the owner's lifetime, a special cash fund is built up in this plan, ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Third, mortgage interest is only 4%, and there is a liberal allowance to help cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Fourth, as your mortgage shrinks, the cash fund increases. You can use it to pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in approximately 14 years. What if I don't use this cash fund? Who gets it when the mortgage is paid off? You do. It's all yours. That's why I call this plan a money saver. After the mortgage is paid, this cash fund equals about half the original loan. All in all, a man is mighty lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. Who can tell me if I qualify, Mr. Keating? Ask your Equitable Society representative. Get full information on the plan that protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. Look in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to our FBI file, The Careless Killer. The cold-blooded murder in tonight's case in the files of your FBI would be shocking if it happened in the lives of ordinary people. But it ceases to be surprising when it occurs in the lives of a criminal family. It seems like a stunning climax only because it violates every basic precept of family life. Love, loyalty, devotion, and protection. But those characteristics are connected with the lives of those who live by the law, who regard their fellow human beings with compassion and understanding. Love, loyalty, devotion, and protection are not in the criminal vocabulary because they would stand in his way when he was stealing or murdering. To the criminal, nothing must be allowed to shackle his desires. In his own mind, the world was built to provide him with a living, an effortless living. And in quest of that kind of a life, the criminal will stop at nothing. The night's file continues at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk as Detective Harvey enters. I didn't think you'd still be here, Jim. Hello, Bob. Doing a little night work. These are Carson's books and papers. Oh, I see. Uh, Anything on that man Rockford? No, you terrorists have given us the slip. For a while, at least. Did the police go to his apartment? Yes. What happened? Well, I'm kind of ashamed to tell you this. Uh, What? They neglected to surround the place, and he made a getaway out of one of the windows. That's too bad. I'll hope he's picked up soon. I want to talk to him. About Carson's operation? Mm Mm-hmm. He could be a valuable source of information on how he operated. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes. Yes, he is. Just a minute, please. Bob, it's for you. Oh, here. Thanks. Hello? Yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. I see. I'll get on it right away. Right, sir. I was lead on Rockford, Jim. Oh, has he been located? No, but they learned that his mother-in-law owns a nightclub right downtown here. A place called the Club Adrian. Oh, yeah, I've heard of it. How about coming over there with me? Good idea. I'll be right with you. <laughs> Meg, will you cut that out? I feel just like Betty Jane. Who's she? Betty Jane, Girl of the Hills, that radio program. Oh, that. You should suffer so long. 
she, too, has no husband. Look, save those crocodile tears. You miss him just about as much as I miss Hitler. But he died so bravely. Yeah, just as he was about to shoot your mother. Now cut it out. Mom. Yeah. What are you going to do with him? Get rid of him, of course. Where is he now? In a closet in the back hall. Will anyone find his body? Eventually. Look, go on outside in the club and get a drink or something, will you? Yeah, but there's a couple of things I want to ask you. What? Well, first of all, should I start wearing black? Oh, that'd be great. The guy's body may not turn up for months. But I look good in black. Look, please go outside, honey. How are you going to get rid of him? I told one of the boys to pick up a truck of some kind. Steal it? Yeah, he'll come around to the back of the club and we'll load the body in after we close. Oh. Now, will you go outside? There's a lot of guys in the joint looking for young girls to dance with. Well, why didn't you say so? Quite a dive, huh, Jim? (laughs) It's hard for me to tell. I can't see very well through this haze of smoke. I wonder if the owner will join us. Mrs. Wilton? Yes. Oh, did you tell the captain we'd like to see her? Yes, but that doesn't... I beg your pardon, boys. Did you want to see me? Are you Mrs. Wilton? That's right. How do you do? My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. This is Detective Harvey of the local police. Hello. Hello. Well, you boys just about cover everything, huh? (laughs) Just about. (laughs) Glad to see you. Thanks. Uh, won't you join us for a moment? What's on your mind? We'd like to talk to you, if we may. Oh, sure. Here, sit right here. Thanks. Will you have a drink? Oh, thanks. I just sell the stuff. Well, go ahead. It's about your son-in-law, Mrs. Wooden. I figured that was it. He killed a man today. Yeah, I read it in the papers. And so far, your son-in-law has managed to elude the police. I was wondering if uh, you had seen anything of him. No. Hmm. And frankly, I don't want to. How about your daughter? Has she heard anything of him? No. How do you know? She's been with me all day and tonight. Is she at the club here now? We'd like to talk to her, too. Well, she ain't around at the moment. If you was to come back later or wait here a while... Oh, there you are. I've been looking all over for you, Mom. Is this your daughter? Yeah. I've just been dancing with that cute little guy. He works for an advertising Uh, agency. Excuse me, Mrs. Rockford. Yeah? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? I've come here to find out about your husband. I already told you. We ain't seen him. Oh, Oh, no, we ain't seen him, all right. Not at all. Go finish your dance, honey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, Goodbye. Nice to have met you. (laughs) You see, she don't know any more about him than I do. Yes, I gathered that. How about a drink for you boys? Uh, Uh, no, thanks. We've got to be going. Well, if the guy turns up, you can believe me. I'll get right in touch with you. I ain't looking for the kind of trouble he carries. Well, Jim? Pretty phony routine she gave us. Yeah. I think they've heard from Rockford, all right. In fact, I know they have. How's that? You remember that ring that Carson's secretary said that Rockford was wearing? Yes. Black onyx with three diamond chips. Mm -hmm. Well, his wife was wearing it tonight. Oh. Mm -hmm. Of course, it could be a duplicate, but I doubt it. Well, that means that he's been back here at the club. I think so. It could also... Look out, Bob! Hey. Thanks, Jim. It's okay. That would have been a nice finish. Knocked off by a truck from a diaper service. (laughs) Yeah. He certainly was... Hey. Wait a minute, Bob. What? That alley the truck just went down. I'd like to see where it leads to. Okay. Seems to go around back of the club. Mm -hmm. What would a diaper truck be doing back there? Bob, if Rockford is still in the club, they could be using that truck to get him out. That's logical. No one would ever suspect he was getting away in that. Bob. Yes, Jim? Let's find a patrolman. Have him cover the front door of this club. Okay. I'll cover this alley and keep an eye on the truck. Right. You get down and pick up a warrant for us to search this place at once. Peg, open up the door of that truck. Very well. Well, hurry up about it. This guy's heavy. Yes, Mom. Oh, well, you cut out that sniveling. This is his funeral, Mom. And I ain't even wearing black. Yeah, I know. Girl of the hills. Where's the truck driver? Inside, grabbing a drink. 
Now we got it. Quiet. What's that? Good evening, Mrs. Wilton. Who is it? Special Agent Taylor. The FBI. Oh. Hello there. I thought I heard some kind of activity going on back here. Yeah. Just taking in some laundry. Oh. And is your laundry usually delivered in a diaper truck? Yeah. Okay, Peg, you can tell the driver to come out. Oh, just a minute. Huh? I'm curious to know what it is you were putting in the truck, Mrs. Wilton. What do you mean? You just carried something in there, didn't you? No. You mind if I take a look in there anyway? No, no, don't. Shut up. What's wrong, miss? Keep away from that truck. Why? I've got a gun here. That's reason enough. That wouldn't be Rockford's body in there, would it? Real smart, ain't you? No, just observant. Well, that observant stuff ain't going to do you any good. Mom, take it easy. We might just as well add another body to the collection. Give me that gun. Not a chance, mister. Yeah, who's uh, that? Give me that gun. No, let go of me. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wilton. I have a search warrant. Ah, oh, Bob, you'd better change it to an arrest warrant for murder. <laughs> Mrs. Wilton was convicted in the state court of first-degree murder and sentenced to be executed. Her daughter was convicted for her part in the murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Too much credit for the closing of tonight's case in the files of your FBI cannot go to the local police department whose cooperation has extended to the fullest extent. And it is true that in many cases throughout the year... Your FBI would find their investigations much more difficult without the help of local law enforcement agencies. For that reason, the Federal Bureau of Investigation urges you to do your part as a citizen in seeing to it that your community has the strongest possible local police force. And by doing that, you'll be doing your part in fighting the crime wave. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Uh, Mr. Keating, about that assured home ownership plan. My next move is to see my equitable society representative and find out if I can qualify. Is that right? Right you are, Ed. And he'll tell you more about what you get in one package from the equitable society. A mortgage that's paid in full if the owner dies. If not, a cash fund to be used in financial emergencies and mortgage interest at only 4%. No wonder it's called America's finest plan for home ownership. So don't delay. See your equitable representative soon. Or write to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, We will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Unhappy Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The unhappy hijacker on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you taking a vacation this month? Here in the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we like to think that the 12 million policyholders and beneficiaries who own or will benefit by Equitable Society life insurance policies will have a specially enjoyable vacation. Holidays unmarred by fears and worries. Through life insurance with the Equitable Society, they have safeguarded their homes, provided secure futures for themselves. So, for a carefree vacation, for a worry-free holiday, better get in touch with your Equitable Society representative before you go. Tonight's FBI file, The Unhappy Hijacker. Last year, there were more than a million and a half major crimes committed in the United States. Of the people arrested for those crimes, more than half had previous arrest records. And some of those arrested had records which covered many pages, many states, and many years. They are the professional criminals. The ones to whom a previous sentence is merely an interruption of their careers. They are driven on by many complex usages. But the basic ingredient behind their continuance as criminals is that they are sure they won't make the same mistake again. The mistake that resulted in their previous capture, arrest, and imprisonment. They're confident that their experience has made them smarter than all the police in the world. And when they have achieved that state of illusion, no crime is beyond them. Armed robbery, arson, or even murder. Tonight's FBI file opens in a comfortable frame house located in a large city in one of our Midwestern states. One of the occupants of this dwelling, a Mrs. Johnson, is just answering the front doorbell. Yes? Hello, Mrs. Johnson. Hello. I'm Mildred Phelps, remember me? Yes. I, um, I talked to Mr. Johnson before I made an appointment to see him. I know. Well, can I come in? Come ahead. Thanks. He's out in the greenhouse. Follow me. Okay. I haven't seen you for a long time, Mrs. Johnson. I know. How have you been? My husband's in here. George? Yes, Mama? Here's your company. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Hello there, Mildred. Hey, this is really a layout. The greenhouse? Yeah, look at those orchids. I have over a dozen species here. This is my hobby. I spend a great deal of time with them. No wonder nobody sees you anymore. Well, I'm pretty much out of action these days. Completely out? No. Excuse me a second, Mother. This orchid needs a little attention. Mr. Johnson, I have something I think will interest you. What is it? Did you read this morning's paper? Uh Uh-huh. See the story about a truckload of whiskey being hijacked? Yes, yes, I did. That's why I'm here. Well, what's the story? I know who knocked it off. And I know where it's stored. Well? If I told you how you could get it, how much would the information be worth? Uh, you want me to take it from the person who hijacked? Well, it wouldn't be the first time, would it, George? No. There's 300 cases, high-grade scotch. What's my cut? Well, in the past, I've always paid $10 a case. You've got a deal. Oh, wait a minute. I want to find out a few things first. Where is the stuff? How do I get it? I'll call you this afternoon and give you all the dope. Uh, Who am I taking it from? Does that matter? Yes. Look, I'd rather not tell. Oh, Mildred, I have to know who did the job. Okay. It's Paul Carter. What? Well, he's your boyfriend. He was my boyfriend. Oh. So that's it. Yeah. Dirty pool, Mildred. He deserves it. Does it bother you? Not at all. In fact, I'd like to hand Paul one myself. I figured that. Well, how about it? 
I'll be glad to do business with you. Well, Paul, that's the story. And the sucker fell for it, huh? Real big. Good. Now, suppose you tell me what this is all about. Well, to coin a phrase, I'm uh, killing two birds with one stone. What do you mean? That truck I hijacked was awful hot. I got to get rid of it. So I'm going to let Mr. Johnson take it off my hand. But, honey, what about the whiskey? I've already taken that out, but I've left the empty cases. Oh. Where is the stuff? I took it to that building I rented over on 12th Street. I see. What's the other bridge you're killing? George Johnson. I've owed him one for a long time. But how are you getting even? He still winds up with a truck. He winds up with trouble. How? I know pretty much how he operates. When he gets his truck tonight, he'll drive it right to his house. It'll be too late for him to unload it until morning. Hmm. By that time, I'll uh, have called the cops. Oh. And they pick him up for the hijack. Right. Oh, that's very cute. <laughs> what do I say to the guy when I call him? Uh, I give him the address where the truck is. They can get in through a window at the back. Tell him nobody will be there between 10 and 12 tonight. Okay. Oh, uh, and uh, one other thing. Yeah? He promised you 10 bucks a case? That's right. Say you'll come around to his place at midnight to collect. Wait a minute. Suppose he finds out the truck is empty. Honey, it's all locked up, believe me. Won't find out till the morning. Meantime, he pays us three grand for the privilege of going to jail. In the same city at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just entering the office of the agent in charge. May I see you, Mr. Morgan? Yes, come in, Jim. I've been waiting for you to come back to the office. Well, I've been caught all day. What's on your mind? I don't imagine you've had a chance to read the report on a hijacking that occurred last night. No, I haven't. A liquor truck was waylaid just across the state line. Just one man did the job. Oh? He overpowered the driver when he stopped for a traffic light on a lonely stretch of road. I see. The driver was severely beaten and left by the side of the road. Uh -huh. However, he managed to make his way to a nearby filling station and report the crime. Now, what time did all this happen? Well, the hijacking occurred at approximately 12.30 a.m. The driver reported it to the police about two hours later. Any leads? Yes, sir. The police checked with the toll booth on Midway Bridge as soon as they received the report. And? And they remembered the truck. It had passed through about an hour before. Then it came here to the city? Yes, sir. So they immediately sent out an alarm on it here. Any results? Well, a truck very much like it was spotted driving through the West End about 3 a.m. It disappeared, however, before it could be picked up. Mm. Any report on it since? No, sir. But we've set up a procedure that may bring some results. What's that? Well, the section where the truck was last seen is at the tip of that peninsula that juts out into the river. Yes. Yeah. Now, going on the theory that it found cover there someplace, we've blocked out the whole area. Fine. The police are cooperating with us, and we're going to search every building. Good, good. Uh, what about the driver? He's in a hospital, sir. Uh, could he give any description of the hijacker? No, not too good a one. Police have brought some pictures down to the hospital to him for him to look at. Fine, that's fine. I'll let you know, sir, if we get any results. <laughs> George. Yes, Mama. Are you getting ready to go out? Uh, yes. You promised to take me to the movies tonight. Oh. Oh, that's right, I did. Well? Mama, I'll, I'm afraid we'll have to make it some other evening. Why? Well, tonight I have to go out on some business. I have a chance to make a very nice score. Mm hmm I heard of a truck full of liquor that's been hijacked. I was tipped off how to pick it up. I, I got to go over there right now. Wait a minute. Who tipped you off? Uh, Mildred Phelps. How did she know about it? Well, Paul Carter did the job. She goes with Paul Carter. Uh, she used to, Mama. That's all over. She's very mad at him. That's why she gave me the information. Now, I, I have to go Wait. over there. Sit down. But, Mama... Sit down, I said. Very well. Now, listen to me. I don't like that Mildred Phelps. And I don't trust her. Mama. Let me finish. Paul Carter's been an enemy of yours for years. It sounds to me as if they put their heads together and have come up with some scheme to get you in trouble. Well, how can that be? She told me where the truck is. I know. Well, then what can be wrong? George, take my word for it. They're up to something. Mama, I've got to go over there. This is too good to pass up. Very well. Go ahead. Be stubborn. 
But do me one favor. What's that? Check every detail of her story before you take that truck. Any news, Jim? Oh, hello, Mr. Morgan. I didn't think you'd be here this late. Any report on the hijacked truck? No, sir, not yet. What have you got there? Oh, this detailed map of the peninsula where the truck was last seen. Uh Uh-huh. Now, those white pins indicate every possible building in which the truck could have been stored. I see. And the blue pins here indicate places that have already been checked by the police. Uh Uh-huh. How many men have they got on the job? A detail of over two dozen, sir. Good, good. They've been calling in every hour all evening, giving their reports. Well, you're certainly doing a thorough job, Jim. Thank you, sir. Oh, say, uh, Hmm? the driver look over those pictures of suspects? Yes, sir. He picked out five men that might possibly have been his assailant. The police are rounding them up now. Yes, sir. Oh, excuse me, sir. Surely. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, hello there, Sergeant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good work. Will you let me have that address? Mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks a lot. I'll be right over. Well, sir, they found the truck. Fine. It's in a small garage on West Street. I'm going right over there. Mrs. Johnson. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Johnson get home yet? Yes, he's here. George? Yes, Mama? Your company's here again. Oh. Hello there, Mildred. Hiya, George. How'd everything go? Just fine. No trouble, huh? No trouble at all. Oh, that's swell. Well, you can pay me off then, if you will, and I'll be on my way. What's your hurry? Well, it's pretty late, you know. Let's have the dough, huh, George? I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Mildred. What? There isn't going to be any payoff. What are you talking about? You got the truck, didn't you? No. I thought you said everything went okay. It did. But not the way you planned. What is this? Well, uh, before I went over for the truck tonight, I told my wife the whole story. So? Well, I don't like to say this, but at times, Mama has a very suspicious nature. She didn't believe your story. Now, look. Let me finish. She uh, warned me to proceed very cautiously, so when I went to the garage, I decided to examine the truck before I moved it out. Tell her what you found. There was no whiskey. The truck was empty. Well, I, I don't understand that. I think you do. Tell her the rest, George. Well, I realized then that Mama was right. Something was wrong. Look, I don't want to hear any more of this. He hasn't finished. I don't care. I'm getting out of here. Just stay where you are. Now, George, finish your story. Very well. You see, I decided to wait around the garage. I figured if it was a trap that Paul might drop by later to see if the truck was gone. (laughs) That's just what he did. Paul came in? Yes. What happened? We discussed the matter, and then I left him there. Left him. What he means is, your boyfriend, Paul, is dead. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Did you ever hear of a professional worry lifter? Hmm? What in the world is that? I mean a man whose life work is lifting the burden of worry from other people's shoulders. Not just a man who says, cheer up, everything is going to be all right, but a man who actually does something about it. Oh, sounds like a man worth knowing. He is. He's your equitable society representative. You'll find that if you have fears about your family's future, your equitable society representative will leave no stone unturned to do a complete job of worry lifting. For instance... Lots of husbands worry because no one ever told them about readjustment income. Readjustment income? What's that? The Equitable Society's Readjustment Income Plan provides extra income for the widow during the two toughest years, the two years immediately following her husband's death, years in which she is adjusting the family way of life to a lowered income. You know, expenses can't be reduced overnight. It takes time. And that's why every life insurance program should provide readjustment income. 
for extra help during the two toughest years. As a matter of fact, the thought of those years has worried me. How much does one of those readjustment income plans cost? Why, it may not cost you a cent. It may require only a simple rearranging of your present life insurance program. In any event, the man to see is your professional worry lifter, your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book for the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Unhappy Hijacker. Occasionally, there comes along a criminal who is so publicized as to make the public believe that they understand him. And understanding him, they'll want to sympathize. If you have ever been a victim of that kind of thinking, you have been experiencing the wrong emotion. The only feeling you should have for the professional criminal is one of revulsion. He is not a person whose mind you can understand because his life is built on moral standards that you know nothing about. Moral standards which not only condone, but approve lying, cheating, and above all, double-crossing. As you can see from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, they're all treacherous, evil people, and they want none of your sympathy or your friendship. Because to the criminal, you, as a decent citizen represent only one thing, his next victim. Tonight's file continues the following morning at the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is just making a report. Good morning, Mr. Morgan. Oh, good morning, Jim. Did you complete your investigation on that hijacking case last night? Well, no, sir. I'm sorry to say I didn't. Oh, what happened? I thought the police had located the truck. Oh, they did. Well? That only led to further complications. How do you mean? Well, let me give you the whole story. Yeah, go ahead. When I arrived at the garage, I learned that the police had found the body of a man named Paul Carter in the back of the truck. Paul Carter? Yes, he was a small-time racketeer and thief. One of the five suspects that the truck driver had identified from those pictures. Obviously, he was the right one. Yes, but that only complicated the case. How's that? The whiskey had been removed from the truck. Now, we searched the premises completely, but couldn't find any trace of it. Any lead on who killed Carter? No, sir, not yet. We found a window in the back of the garage that had been jimmied open. That was evidently how the killer came in. I see. There was a peculiar matted substance on the windowsill. It appeared to have come off the intruder's shoe. A matted substance? Yes, it resembled moss. I sent it on to the laboratory last night. We should have a report on it soon. Uh-huh. Say, this killer could have taken the whiskey. And that would keep us in the case. Yes, I know. Have the police checked on Carter's associates or enemies? Well, they're doing that now. They're also trying to learn where Carter lived, and as soon as they have any information, they'll get in touch with us. Good morning, Mildred. Oh, gosh, I forgot you can't talk with that gag at your mouth. Here, let me untie it for you. There we are. Did you have a good night? Now, what do you think? Oh, must be pretty uncomfortable. You can say that again. Why are you keeping me here? Well, uh, Mama and I had to have a little talk. We had to decide what we should do with you. Well? We're going to let you leave here. Oh. On one condition. What's that? If you tell us what Paul did with that whiskey. I... I don't know. Oh, Mildred, you must He know. didn't tell me anything about it. Now, please, tell the truth. You'll only make Mama mad at you all Mama, over. Mama, haven't you got anything to say around here? Of course. Well, I haven't noticed it. Everything you do is in order for Mama. That's not true. George. Yes? Why do you let her run your life? Why don't you get smart? You're clever, attractive. Why don't you act like a man? Mildred. I mean it. Look, baby, if you just let me leave here, I'll... Be... Mildred, pick on somebody your own size. Mama, I've just been asking her about the whiskey. Leave me alone with her. I'll get the information. Well, Mr. Morgan. Yes, Jim? A report just came in from the laboratory on that substance I found at the scene of the killing. Oh, what was it? Well, they describe it as a plant called fern root. It's a 
species of moss. I see. They also said that it's not native to this section. It's found mostly in the eastern states. Well, that's strange. You say you believe it came from the killer's shoe? That's right, sir. There was a suggestion of a heel imprint on it. That's where I got that idea. You keep coming up with puzzlers on this one, don't you? <laughs> oh, by the way, a list of Paul Carter's enemies just came in. There's uh, 22 names on it. Ooh, quite a roster. Mm -hmm. Won't be easy to pick any individual out of that. No. Police are cooperating with our agents, checking up on the men, finding out about their backgrounds, when they saw Carter last. And... Oh, excuse me, sir. Certainly, sir. Morgan speaking. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jim, Sir? Uh, copy down this address. All right. uh, go ahead. 228 North Adams Street. I have it, sir. We have it. Yes, yes, he will. Goodbye. That was police headquarters, Jim. No. That address I just gave you is where Paul Carter lived. I told the police you'd be right over there. <laughs> Yes, Mama. You can come in here now. Very well. How did you make out? I got the information. Good for you. What did you do to her? Never mind. Found out where the whiskey is. Where? Tell him. Tell him, I said. It's in a building over on 12th Street. Give him the address. Number 741. 300 cases are there? Yes. Look at her. She isn't so pretty now, is she? Mom, I never thought she was pretty. You could have, if I hadn't come in. Oh, stop. I'll go get the stuff right away. That's a good idea. What about me? Can I go now? No. But you said I... You're staying here until my husband gets back with the whiskey. I want to be sure you told us the truth. Mr. Morgan, I'm a little ashamed to be coming in like this again. Well, what do you mean, Jim? I have to report another failure. What is it this time? Well, I went to the place where Carter lived. It was a small apartment downtown. Yeah. The police had already arrived there. They'd searched his effects. They found a rental receipt for a small building over on 12th Street. In Carter's name? That's right, sir. We went over there and found that it was the place he had used to store the liquor. Had used? Yes. By the time we got there, it was gone. Well, how did you know it had been there? Well, there were several boxes and a few broken bottles of the same brand that Carter had hijacked. Oh. Well, does that mean he moved it to another place before he was killed? I don't think so. Well, why not? A truck had just recently been driven into the building. We could still smell the exhaust fumes. Oh. Mr. Morgan, I have an idea that whoever killed Carter is the same person that came and took away the whiskey. What do you base that on, Jim? Well, I found several particles of what appeared to be that same matted substance that I picked up on the windowsill back at the garage. The fern roof? Yes. I dropped it off the laboratory. They're going to make a quick comparison. Oh. You say a truck was used? That's right, sir. Were there any tire impressions? No, sir, there weren't. It was a concrete floor. No moisture. Oh. Hey, come in. Excuse me, sir. Now, what is it, Tom? I have a report from the laboratory. It's with Jim. Oh, let me have it, huh? There you are. Thanks, Tom. Right. Is that a report on the second fern root sample, Jim? Um, yes, sir. It's the same substance. Something else, too. What? The laboratory says that fern root is used in the growing of orchids. Hey, wait a minute. Well, what are you looking for? That list of Carter's enemies. I think it'll tell us who the killer is. <laughs> That you, George? Yes, Mama. Right in here. Uh huh. How'd you make out? Fine. How many cases were there? Three hundred, just like she said. Well, what'd you do with it? It's out back in the shed. Oh, I'm tired. It's been a busy day. Yes. Did you keep supper for me? Mm, it's all ready. Good. Oh, well, where's Mildred? Next room. Well, I guess you can let her go now. Are you serious? Well, that's what you promised her. Only to find out where the liquor was. You can't let her go. She'd tell the police about your killing Paul. Oh. Oh, that's right. What else can we do with her? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Kill her, too? Of course. I see. When? Right now. Before supper? Yes. 
Very well. You set out the food. This won't take it. What is that? My greenhouse. Someone broke a window. George. My orchids, Mama. My orchids. Oh, look. The glass door is broken. I had to break it, Johnson. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. What? Huh? I want to talk to you about a case of whiskey and murder. <laughs> George Johnson was turned over to state authorities, convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to be executed. Mrs. Johnson was given a life sentence as an accomplice. And thus, another cluster of criminal careers was brought to a close, mainly because of the fine work done by your FBI's special laboratory. 1947's crop of criminals includes those who have taken advantage of modern inventions, and no law enforcement agency could cope with them unless it, too, used the aid of science in its investigations. The night's case involved the use of the spectroscope, one of the many machines which are at work even now at Washington, D.C., in the laboratory of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. At work for you and for your FBI. <laughs> In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, Mr. Keating, uh, let me see if I have this Equitable Society readjustment income plan straight. As I understand it, this plan would give my wife extra income during the first two years after my death. That's right, Jim. Extra cash every month for two years to give her time to adjust her expenses to a new standard of living. Well, knowing my wife was going to get that would surely take a load off my mind. Then let me suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Let him show you how little it costs to provide your wife with equitable readjustment income. Call your Equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the red-headed blackmailer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The red-headed blackmailer on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.